Sir Joseph Austin Chamberlain, K.G. The 16th of October 1863 to the 16th of March 1937 was a British statesman, son of Joseph Chamberlain and half brother of Neville Chamberlain. He stood for the Liberal Unionist Party, which merged with the Conservatives in 1912 and led the Conservatives in the Commons in 1921-22. As Foreign Secretary, he negotiated the Locarno Pact 1925, aimed at preventing war between France and Germany, for which he was awarded the Nobel Peace Prize. He was one of the few MPs supporting Winston Churchill's appeals for rearmament against the German threat in the 1930s. Topic Early life and career Austin Chamberlain was born in Birmingham, the second child and eldest son of Joseph Chamberlain, then a rising industrialist and political radical, later mayor of Birmingham and a dominant figure in liberal and unionist politics at the end of the 19th century. His mother, the former Harriet Kenrick, died in childbirth, leaving his father so shaken that for almost 25 years he maintained a distance from his first-born son. In 1868, his father married Harriet's cousin, Florence, and had further children, the oldest of whom, Arthur Neville, would become Prime Minister in the year of Austin's death. Austin was educated first at rugby school, before passing on to Trinity College, Cambridge. While at Trinity College, he became a lifelong friend of F. S. Oliver, a future advocate of Imperial Federation and, after 1909, a prominent member of the Round Table Movement. Chamberlain made his first political address in 1884 at a meeting of the university's political society and was vice president of the Cambridge Union Society. It would seem that from an early age his father had intended for politics to be Austin's future path, and with that in mind, he was sent first to France, where he studied at the Paris Institute of Political Studies and developed a lasting admiration for the French people and culture. For nine months, he was shown the brilliance of Paris under the Third Republic, and he met and dined with the likes of Georges Clemenceau and Alexander Ribot. From Paris, Austin was sent to Berlin for twelve months, to imbibe the political culture of the other great European power, Germany. Though in his letters home to Beatrice and Neville, he showed an obvious preference for France and the lifestyle he had left behind there, Chamberlain undertook to learn German and learn from his experience in the capital of the Second Reich. Among others, Austin met and dined with the Iron Chancellor, Otto von Bismarck, an experience that was to hold a special place in his heart for the duration of his life. While attending the University of Berlin, Austin developed a suspicion of the growing nationalism in Germany based upon his experience of the lecturing style of Heinrich von Treitschke, who opened up to him, a new side of the German character, a narrow-minded, proud, intolerant Prussian chauvinism the consequences of which he was later to ponder during the First World War and the crises of the 1930s. Austin returned to England in 1888, lured largely by the prize of a parliamentary constituency. He was first elected to Parliament as a member of his father's own Liberal Unionist Party in 1892, sitting for the seat of East Worcestershire. Owing to the prominence of his father and the alliance between the anti-home rule liberal unionists and conservatives, Chamberlain was returned unopposed on 30 March, and at the first sitting of the new session, he walked up the floor of the house flanked by his father and his uncle, Richard. Owing to the dissolution of Parliament and the 1892 general election that August, Chamberlain was unable to make his maiden speech until April 1893, but, when delivered, it was acclaimed by the four-time Prime Minister William Ewart Gladstone as one of the best speeches which has been made. That Chamberlain was speaking against Gladstone's own second Home Rule Bill does not seem to have dampened the enthusiasm of the Prime Minister, who responded by publicly congratulating both Austin and his father, Joseph, on such an excellent performance. That was highly significant, given the bad blood existing between Joseph Chamberlain and his former leader. <laughs> Political office Appointed a junior whip of the Liberal Unionists after the general election, Austin's main role was to act as his father's standard bearer in matters of policy. Following the Conservative and Unionist landslide win in the election of 1895, Chamberlain was appointed Civil Lord of the Admiralty, holding that post until 1900, when he became Financial Secretary to the Treasury. 
Lord Salisbury retired as Prime Minister in July 1902, and the following month Chamberlain was promoted to the position of Postmaster General by the new Premier, the Conservative Arthur J. Balfour, who also designated this a cabinet position, and appointed him to the Privy Council. In the wake of the struggle between his father and Balfour, Austin Chamberlain became Chancellor of the Exchequer in 1903. Austin's appointment was largely a compromise solution to the bitter division of the two Unionist heavyweights, which threatened to split the coalition between supporters of Chamberlain's imperial tariff campaign and Balfour's more cautious advocacy of protectionism. While Austin supported his father's program, his influence within the cabinet was diminished following the departure of the senior Chamberlain to become backbenchers. Facing a resurgent liberal opposition and the threat of an internal party split, Balfour eventually took the Unionists into opposition in December 1905, and in the ensuing rout in the election of 1906, Austin found himself one of the few surviving liberal Unionists in the House of Commons. After his father's stroke and enforced retirement from active politics a few months later, Austin became the effective leader of the tariff reform campaign within the Unionist Party, and thus, he was a contender for the eventual leadership of the party itself. <laughs> <laughs> leadership questions With the Unionists in disarray after electoral defeats at both the January and December 1910 elections, Balfour was forced from his position as party leader in November 1911. Chamberlain was one of the leading candidates to succeed as Conservative leader even though he was still technically a member of the Liberal Unionist wing of the coalition the two parties merged formally only in 1912. Chamberlain was opposed by Canadian-born Boner Law, Walter Long and Irish Unionist Edward Carson. Given their standing in the party, only Chamberlain and Long had a realistic chance of success and though Balfour had intended Chamberlain to succeed him, it became clear from an early canvas of the sitting MPs that Long would be elected by a slender margin. After a short period of internal party campaigning, Chamberlain determined to withdraw from the contest for the good of the still divided party. He succeeded in persuading Long to withdraw with him in favor of Boner Law, who was subsequently chosen by unanimous vote as a compromise candidate. Chamberlain's action, while it prevented him from attaining the party leadership and, arguably, the premiership, did a great deal to maintain unity within the conservative and liberal unionist parties at a time of great uncertainty and strain. <inaudible> <inaudible> Irish Home Rule In the last years before the outbreak of World War I, Chamberlain was concerned with one issue above all others, Home Rule for Ireland. The issue that had prompted his father to leave the Liberal Party in the 1880s now threatened to spill over into outright civil war, with the government of H. H. Asquith committed to the passage of a third Home Rule Bill. Chamberlain was resolutely opposed to the dissolution of the Union with Ireland. To the strain then was added the death of his father in July 1914, only a few days after the assassination of Archduke Franz Ferdinand of Austria, which began the train of events that led to the war. First World War Pressure from the conservative opposition, in part led by Chamberlain, eventually resulted in the formation of the wartime coalition government, in 1915. Chamberlain joined the cabinet as Secretary of State for India. Like other politicians, including Arthur Balfour and George Curzon, Chamberlain supported the invasion of Mesopotamia to increase British prestige in the region, thus discouraging a German-inspired Muslim revolt in India. Chamberlain remained at the India office after David Lloyd George succeeded Asquith as Prime Minister in late 1916, but following inquiries into the failure of the Mesopotamian campaign undertaken by the separately administered Indian Army in 1915, including the loss of the British garrison during the Siege of Kut. Chamberlain resigned his post in 1917, as the minister ultimately responsible, the fault lay with him. He was widely acclaimed for such a principled act, after Lloyd George's Paris speech the 12th of November 1917, at which he said that, "...when he saw the appalling casualty lists he wish ed, it had not been necessary to win so many victories." Quote, closing parenthesis, quote. There was talk of Chamberlain withdrawing support from the government. Lloyd George survived by claiming that the aim of the new Inter-Allied Supreme War Council was purely to coordinate 
policy, not to overrule the British generals, who still enjoyed a good deal of support from Conservatives. Later, he returned to government and became a member of the War Cabinet in April 1918 as Minister without portfolio, replacing Lord Milner, who had become Secretary of State for War. Following the victory of the Lloyd George coalition in the 1918 general election, Chamberlain was again appointed to the position of Chancellor of the Exchequer in January 1919 and immediately faced the huge task of restoring Britain's finances after four years of wartime expenditure. <laughs> <laughs> Leadership Citing ill health, Boner Law retired from the leadership of the conservative branch of the Lloyd George government in the spring of 1921. His seniority and the general dislike of Curzon, his counterpart in the House of Lords, helped Chamberlain to both succeed Boner Law as leader of the House of Commons and take over in the office of Lord Privy Seal. He was succeeded at the Exchequer by Sir Robert Horne. It seemed that after ten years of waiting, Austin would again be given the opportunity of succeeding to the premiership. The Lloyd George coalition was beginning to falter, following numerous scandals and the unsuccessful conclusion of the Anglo-Irish War, and it was widely believed that it would not survive until the next general election. He had previously had little regard for Lloyd George, but the opportunity of working closely with the Welsh wizard gave Chamberlain a new insight into his nominal superior in the government. By now, the Conservative Party was by far the largest partner in the government. It was an unfortunate change of allegiance for Chamberlain, for by late 1921, the Conservative backbenchers were growing more and more restless for an end to the coalition and a return to single-party government. Conservatives in the House of Lords began, in public, to oppose the coalition, disregarding calls for support from Chamberlain. In the country at large, Conservative candidates began to oppose the coalition at by-elections, and discontent spread to the House of Commons. In the autumn of 1922, Chamberlain faced a backbench revolt, largely led by Stanley Baldwin, designed to oust Lloyd George, and when he summoned the Carlton Club meeting 19 October 1922, of Conservative MPs, a motion was there passed for fighting the forthcoming election as an independent party. Chamberlain resigned the party leadership rather than act against what he believed to be his duty. He was succeeded by Boner Law, whose views and intentions he had predicted the evening before the vote at a private meeting. Boner Law formed a government shortly thereafter, but Chamberlain was not given a post, but it seems that he would not have accepted a position even if he had been offered one. Austin and Neville Chamberlain and Ian Duncan Smith are the only three conservative leaders not to lead the party into a general election. Until William Hague 1997 Austin was the only conservative leader in the 20th century not to become prime minister. Foreign Secretary After the second resignation of Boner Law in May 1923 Law died from throat cancer later that year, Chamberlain was passed over again for the leadership of the party in favour of Stanley Baldwin. Baldwin offered Chamberlain the post of Lord Privy Seal, but Chamberlain insisted other former ministers from the coalition to be included as well, Baldwin refused. However, Chamberlain returned to government when Baldwin formed his second ministry following success in the election of October 1924, serving in the important office of Secretary of State for Foreign Affairs from 1924 to 1929. Chamberlain was largely allowed a free hand by the easy-going Baldwin. It is as Foreign Secretary that Chamberlain's place in history was finally assured. In a difficult period in international relations, Chamberlain faced not only a split in the Entente Cordiale by the French invasion of the Ruhr but also the controversy over the 1924 Geneva Protocol, which threatened to dilute British sovereignty over the issue of League of Nations economic sanctions. <laughs> Locarno Pact Despite the importance to history of other pressing issues, his reputation chiefly rests on his part in the negotiations over what came to be known as the Locarno Pact of 1925. Seeking to maintain the post-war status quo in the West, Chamberlain responded favorably to the approaches of German Foreign Minister Gustav Stresemann for a British guarantee of Germany's western borders. Besides promoting Franco-German reconciliation, Chamberlain's main motive was to create a situation in which Germany could pursue territorial revisionism in Eastern Europe peacefully. Chamberlain's understanding was that if Franco-German relations improved, France would gradually abandon the cordon sanitaire, the French alliance system in Eastern Europe between the wars. 
Once France had abandoned its allies in Eastern Europe as the price of better relations with the Reich, the Poles and Czechoslovaks would have no great power ally to protect them, would be forced to adjust to German demands. Chamberlain believed that they would peacefully hand over the territories claimed by Germany such as the Sudetenland, the Polish Corridor and the free city of Danzig. Promoting territorial revisionism in Eastern Europe in Germany's favor was one of Chamberlain's principal reasons for Locarno. Together with Aristide Briand of France, Chamberlain and Striesman met at the town of Locarno in October 1925 and signed a mutual agreement together with representatives from Belgium and Italy to settle all differences between the nations by arbitration, not war. For his services, Chamberlain was not only awarded the Nobel Peace Prize but also made a Knight of the Order of the Garter. He was the first ordinary Knight of the Garter since Elizabethan times Sir Henry Lee to die without having been made a peer. He was the 871st Knight of the Garter. Chamberlain also secured Britain's accession to the kellogg bryan Pact, which theoretically outlawed war as an instrument of policy. Chamberlain infamously said that Italian dictator Benito Mussolini was a man with whom business could be done. <laughs> Later career Following his less satisfactory engagement in issues in the Far East and Egypt, and the resignation of Baldwin's government after the election of 1929, Chamberlain resigned his position as Foreign Secretary and went into retirement. He briefly returned to government in 1931 as First Lord of the Admiralty in Ramsay MacDonald's first national government, but soon retired later that year after having been forced to deal with the unfortunate Invergordon mutiny. Over the next six years as a senior backbencher, he gave strong support to the national government on domestic issues but was critical on foreign policy. In 1935 the government faced a parliamentary rebellion over the Hoare Laval Pact. His opposition to the vote of censure is widely believed to have been instrumental in saving the government from defeat on the floor of the House. Chamberlain was again briefly considered in 1935 for the post of Foreign Secretary but was passed over once the crisis was over for being too old for the job. Instead, his advice was sought as to the suitability of his former parliamentary private secretary, now Minister for the League of Nations, Anthony Eden for the post. Topic. Calls for rearmament From 1934 to 1937, Chamberlain was, with Winston Churchill, Roger Keyes and Leo Amory, the most prominent voice calling for British rearmament in the face of a growing threat from Nazi Germany. In addition to speaking eloquently in Parliament on the matter, he was the chairman of two conservative parliamentary delegations in late 1936 that met with Prime Minister Stanley Baldwin to remonstrate with him about his government's delay in rearming the British Defence Forces. More respected than Churchill, Chamberlain became something of an icon to young conservatives, as the last survivor of the Victorian high politics. Though he never again served in a government, he survived in good health until March 1937, dying just ten weeks before his younger half-brother, Neville, became the first and only member of the Chamberlain dynasty to become Prime Minister. Chamberlain died at the age of 73 in his London home, 24 Egerton Terrace, on 16 March 1937. He is buried in East Finchley Cemetery in London. His estate was valued at probate at £45,044, a relatively modest sum for such a famous public figure. Much of his father's fortune had been lost in an attempt to grow sisal in the West Indies in the early 1890s, and unlike Neville, he never went into business to make money for himself. His personal and political papers are housed in the Cadbury Research Library at the University of Birmingham. Topic personal life In 1906, Chamberlain married Ivy Muriel Dundas died 1941, daughter of Colonel Henry Dundas. They had two sons, Joseph and Lawrence, and a daughter, Diane. During the 1920s, Chamberlain lived at a house called Twits Gill in Fir Toll Road, Mayfield, East Sussex. He sold the house in 1929. R. C. G. Foster said, he kept himself quite aloof from the village and was not popular with his neighbors. He had an interest in rock gardening. At his death, his estate was valued for probate at £45,044.18 over 1. 
Topic styles of address 1863 to 1892 Mr Joseph Austin Chamberlain 1892 to 1902 Mr Joseph Austin Chamberlain MP 1902 to 1925 The Right Honorable Joseph Austin Chamberlain MP 1925 to 1937 The Right Honorable Sir Joseph Austin Chamberlain KG MP Topic See also list of people on the cover of Time magazine 1920s the 30th of November 1925 Topic References topic Further reading For such a prominent historical figure, Chamberlain has had very little attention from academics. The official biography by Sir Charles Petrie is reputable although the more recent work by David Dutton is a far more balanced account. Dutton is widely regarded as the expert on Austin Chamberlain although he disagrees with Richard Grayson's assessment of Chamberlain's views on France and Germany. Peter Marsh, author of the most recent biography of Joseph Chamberlain, is currently studying the Chamberlain family. Richard Scully is investigating Sir Austin's year in Germany and its subsequent effect on his opinions and politics. Topic sources Dutton, David 1985. Austin Chamberlain, Gentleman in Politics. Bolton, R. Anderson. Dutton, D.J. January 2011, 2004. Chamberlain, Sir Joseph Austin 1863 to 1937. Oxford Dictionary of National Biography, online edn ed. Oxford University Press. Grayson, Richard 1997. Austin Chamberlain and the Commitment to Europe: British Foreign Policy, 1924 to 1929. London, Frank Cass. Johnson, Gaynor, March 2011. Sir Austin Chamberlain, The Marquess of Crewe and Anglo-French Relations, 1924–1928. Contemporary British History, 25 No. 1, 49–64, argues that Crewe gave Chamberlain key ideas about French security and disarmament policy, the implementation of the Geneva Protocol, the Treaty of Locarno, and the kellogg bryan Pact. Johnson, Gaynor 2006. Austin Chamberlain and Britain's Relations with France, 1924–1929. Diplomacy and Statecraft 17 No. 4, 753–769. Sir Charles Petrie 1938. The Chamberlain Tradition. London, Lovett Dixon Ltd. Petrie, Sir Charles 1939. The Life and Letters of the Right Hun. Sir Austin Chamberlain. London, Castle & Co. Self, Robert C. Ed. 1995. The Austin Chamberlain Diary Letters, The Correspondence of Sir Austin Chamberlain with His Sisters Hilda and Ida, 1916-1937. Cambridge, Cambridge University Press, CS1 maint, Extra Text, Authors List link. Topic Journals Alexander, M. S., Philpott, W. J. 1998. The Entente Cordiale and the Next War, Anglo-French Views on Future Military Cooperation, 1928-1939. Intelligence and National Security, 13 1, 53-84. doi, 10.1080-026845298084324632463. Topic external links Hansard 1803-2005, Contributions in Parliament by Austin Chamberlain Nobel Biography, Archival Material Relating to Austin Chamberlain. UK National Archives. Newspaper clippings about Austin Chamberlain in the 20th Century Press Archives of the German National Library of Economics ZBW.